All right, welcome back. Our next panel is on insider trading, enforcement trends, key cases, prosecutions, legislation. We have a fantastic panel. Uh, let me first introduce our moderator, Kyle DeYoung. He's a partner at Kirkland and Ellis. Uh, Kyle previously spent seven years at the SEC, most recently as senior counsel to the director of enforcement. Also was the assistant chief litigation counsel in the enforcement division's trial unit. Welcome, Kyle. Thank you. Uh, Steve Cohen is a partner at Sidley and global co-leader of its regulatory and enforcement practice. Steve joined Sidley in 2017 after 12 years at the SEC, where he served as associate director in the enforcement division. Steve, thanks for joining us. Jennifer Leet is an associate for- director in the SEC's division of enforcement. She has served at the SEC for over 20 years and led cases of all types during that time, including many insider trading cases. So she's a Perfect person for this panel. Welcome, Jennifer. Nice to be here. Thank you for having me. Finally, you're joined by John Tuttle. John's a partner at Debevoys in Plimpton, where he represents clients in everything from SEC to DOJ to FINRA to PCAOB matters. Uh, He's universally regarded as a real pro in the securities enforcement world. And we're really grateful to have John here with him uh, with us today. And Most importantly, between John, Jennifer, and myself, we have three alumni from the College of William & Mary, so go Tribe. Uh, Welcome, John. Thanks, Bruce. Great great to be here. All right, Kyle, let me turn it back over to you. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Bruce, for those introductions and for putting together such a fantastic event. Uh, I realize that we are uh, following the big guns, so I am glad that we have such stellar panelists for our discussion about insider trading. Um, it's no surprise to anyone at this conference that insider trading has been a priority for the SEC enforcement for a long time. It uh, seems to be one of the few areas that most commission chairpersons and enforcement directors agree upon. Um, this is true so far for the SEC under Chair Gensor and Director Grawal. Um, you know, the SEC has brought a number of insider trading cases this year covering a wide range of conduct from sophisticated insider trading rings to a uh, Greek guy known as the bull who is selling insider trading chips on the dark web uh, with a number of kind of bread and butter cases in between. Um, Chair Gensler has also drawn specific attention to potential insider trading related to the abuse of 10B51 plans. So I think we have a a timely topic for today. Um, I'd like to start by asking uh, each of our panelists for their high level thoughts on the SEC's recent activity in this area. Jennifer, uh, how about we start with you? Uh, no offense to uh, John and Steve, but you're probably the one that most people are excited to hear from. Uh, sure, I'll go right ahead. First, of course, I need to give the, um, the standard SEC staff disclaimer, which is that uh, my views are my own, and I do not uh, here today speak on behalf of the commission, the commissioners, or other SEC staff. Um, So uh, with regard to insider trading, I think, Kyle, um, the way you've characterized it is very apt. Uh, Insider trading continues to be uh, a priority here at the commission. Um, And you you see that manifest itself in in several different ways. One is recent cases that we've brought, uh, many of which um, are, are fairly typical of SEC enforcement cases and uh, that we've brought over the years. A few recent examples are the Sanchez case in which the commission alleged that an analyst um, in an investment bank's compliance department traded on inside information in advance of at least 45 different events involving the bank's clients. I mean, it was just like a huge record. Um, The Malou case, involving a former um, pharmaceutical global IT manager. That was an $8 million case. I mean, the numbers are not getting smaller. Um, There was the Netflix insider trading case that that drew a fair amount of attention. Um, We we have also, uh, the commission has also been filing cases involving the misuse of non-public information in, in other circumstances. Um, One recent one involves a quant analyst um, involved in a multi-million dollar front-running scheme. That was an eight and a half million dollar case. Um, if Joe Samsone, who's the chief of the market abuse unit, were with us, he would certainly be touting um, the continued use of the market abuse unit analysis um, and detection center, which has identified many of our important cases. Um, areas of particular focus Uh, for this commission include, of course, individuals and senior executives. 
um, and and I'm not going to I'm not going to comment, of course, on, on anything specific in our pipeline. Uh, but I would just reiterate, Kyle, what you said a few moments ago, um, which is that the chair has has repeatedly, including I think less than an hour ago, um, indicated that 10B51 plans that really are a, a priority here. Great. Um, John, uh, let's turn to you for your thoughts. Sure, and awfully hard to follow Jennifer on that, uh, you know, speaking after, uh, after Caesar, so to speak. But uh, the, uh, the, I think what we've seen really, and, and it's hard to distinguish, I think in, in the insider trading area between this commission and the last commission and this director and the last director, because it, insider trading has always been, and I think will continue to be a really core component of the enforcement program. So, so I think, you know, lots of the cases we're seeing now, I'm sure had their origins under, under the prior director, uh, directors. Um, and so I, I think that, you know, it, what, what you see kind of when you step back is, is really the staff hitting kind of all of the high notes of the things that they've been talking about over the past few years, the use of, of big data and analysis to really kind of uncover trading trends and patterns that they can then use to go after people. Um, the, the, you know, kind of a traditional insider trading cases, you mentioned the, the, you know, the dark web case. <laughs> um, you know, I think those kinds of matters are, are always going to be the higher profile, but you also see kind of the steady drumbeat of the regular group of, of corporate insiders or institutional insiders who, who just screw up. And, and I think that, you know, those cases are always going to be there. And, and I think that's kind of what we've seen over the last, um, you know, six to eight to 12 months. Great. And Steve, you have the, the privilege of going last on this one. Not, not, not a lot left to say when you have the opportunity to follow Jennifer and John, um, but I guess I'll just maybe put a finer point on a couple of things that are similar. Although, I mean, it's, it's hard not to want the opportunity to talk about a guy named the bull on the dark web. So I'm just going to say that one was interesting. Um, look, I guess two things. One um, is, as John said, we're always going to see the traditional stuff, right? But when I look at the cases across the last year, it seems to me that although there are the general signature cases that you know, may or may not have come from FINRA, they look like you know, traditional insider trading cases, um, where you see, you know, regular folks trading because they know someone or are connected to someone who are insiders. I, I actually would just emphasize or double down on um, uh, both of your remarks about the, the data uh, analysis and detection center. I think we all know that, you know, John Rymus and others there have been doing hard work for a lot of years. And I think we see it in the cases. I think when you look at the Netflix case, you look at the investment banking case that Jennifer mentioned, um, I think the signatures there are clear. Um, and I think that it, I haven't done any statistical analysis, but it does seem like there's a continued rise in really sophisticated cases arising out of the what, what's clear is um, division, the division's uh, real ability to harness and use big data, to use trading data to generate their own insider trading cases um, and some pretty sophisticated ones at that. Great. Yep. So. One of the recent cases that has generated maybe the most buzz this year is the uh, so-called shadow, shadow trading case that the SEC brought in August. Uh, Jennifer, can you give us some background on, on, on that case and, and maybe a little insight into the SEC's perspective? Sure. So that's the Panawat case um, that the commission filed in August of this year. Uh, Mr. Panawat was employed at a biopharmaceutical company called Medivation. He got material non-public information in the course of his employment that Medivation would be acquired by Pfizer. And according to the allegations in our complaint, he traded on that uh, material non-public information. Um, so far, that's a pretty standard fact pattern in an insider trading case. But Mr. Panawat did not trade in Medivation. He traded in a different company, Insight. Insight is another mid-cap oncology-focused biopharmaceutical company. Um, when the deal was announced, the value of the options he purchased roughly doubled. He made about $100,000, and the commission has filed suit against him alleging violations of 10B for trading on um, material non-public information. So this is the, the first case the commission has filed involving a substitute security uh, which is a term that has appeared in the academic literature, and my understanding is for, for several years. Um, 
there are a couple facts I would just point out um, that are, I think, pretty relevant to um, understanding the case. Um, one of those is Mr. Panawat signed a broad corporate policy against trading on insider information. Uh, Medivation's policy prohibited trading in Medivation securities, but also trading in other publicly traded securities um, on non-public information. Uh, Mr. Panawat had a background in the biopharmaceutical industry. Um, his job at Medivation was to pursue strategic opportunities for the company. So for, for both of these reasons, um, we allege that he was something of an expert in the area, in the sector, um, and that um, relates, of course, to, to his scienter in the case. Um, he also, um, I think he was a, an investment banker in his former life, but he certainly held a securities license and had been previously associated um, with a broker dealer. Um, and I would just add our trial unit, our trial lawyers probably like the fact that he did all the trading from his desk at the office. Yeah, so, yeah. To the other panelists, you know, what do you make of this? Is this is this a game changer? Or I, I know Jennifer mentioned there were a few kind of unique, maybe not unique, but important facts in this case. So, you know, so John, again, I'll start with you again. You, you know, do you think this is a, a a game changer, or do you think the the kind of unique facts in this case are really what carried the day? Well, I mean, I I, I think it's probably a little of both. Um, I, I think it's a game changer in the sense, as as Jennifer mentioned, it's the first time they've actually brought the substitute security case. I I, I don't think it's um, that much of an extension, really, of the misappropriation theory, and and you can take that back really to to the Talbot case uh, that uh, that went up to the Ninth Circuit in in the late early two thousands or mid two thousands, um, where a director of one company. Uh, that owned uh, a percentage of Lending Tree heard about a, a potential acquisition of Lending Tree from the the bidder and uh, and traded in Lending Tree and and the district court dismissed the case on the grounds that that the director didn't know a duty of confidentiality to Lending Tree it wasn't didn't have a, an NDA didn't have anything but but what the Ninth Circuit said is no no you you actually have a duty of confidentiality to your employer. Um, and so I think when you think about the misappropriation theory and the the fact that that the you know the information uh, has to just be about a security, the duty doesn't have to be owed to the issuer of that security. It can be owed to anyone. Um, I, I think you can kind of trace through the lines and and get to where the the, the staff got in the Panawat case, and and we'll see what the court does with it. I think it's. Um, you know, so for my sense, I think it's important that they brought the case and, and interesting and certainly a game changer that they brought the case and are pursuing it. Um, but I, I do think it's, you know, it's kind of an extension of, of the misappropriation theory and, and how it's been applied. And, you know, hopefully it's not that common a situation where people are doing it. But, um, but I, I, I do think that it's something that, uh, that, you know, others of us have been advising, you know, as a potential risk uh, for for lots of, of institutional traders for years. <laughs> Steve, what's your take? Yeah, so a couple, a, a few thoughts. Uh, I, I don't disagree with John. I think it's, it is very interesting that they brought the case. Uh, I don't think it necessarily changes the landscape, um, but a, a few things. First, I think we all saw in the aftermath of it, I think the initial reaction that people had was, oh my goodness, the SEC is gonna start bringing cases, right, arising out of these circumstances where companies might be economically linked or, you know, however you want to phrase it, connected to a case where there's material non-public information. Jennifer highlighted a uniqueness of the company's insider trading policy. I think time will tell to what extent um, the commission viewed that as relevant, right? We all know that uh, companies insider trading policies vary and whether the violation by this particular um, employee by Penuat um, was deemed to be relevant uh, to the commission um, in particular because of that particular policy. I do think it, it certainly is a helpful fact um, for, for the litigators that Jennifer referred to. Um, but I, I guess the other thing I would highlight is um, that, I, that I think is an interesting fact, and we'll see, it, it's not clear, the, the commission highlighted it in the complaint, but it's not clear how relevant it was, is that um, there was additional information that Panuat, as I understand it from the public papers, received uh, from investment bankers that he was privy to beyond simply 
knowing that these competitive that this other competitor right stock price might move um but that as i understand the allegations e even that um there was some non-public feedback from the company's bankers that the there was interest in the marketplace for these competitors it's a small market right for these mid uh biopharmaceutical companies in this particular product line so the link between um you know his employer and this other security wasn't only known to him according to the allegations um, based on his experience, but even based on information that he actually heard um, from his employer. And so I, I highlight those unique facts because I think on one hand, it could be viewed as a potential limiter from the concern people might have about how far this theory might go. In other circumstances, there's a lot of facts here that I think are unique. I'm not suggesting that that's where the commission would land, but I think it's something that people watch. At least when I read the case, I see a lot of very particular things that are specific to this case um, that make, uh, make it understandable to me why this was the case the commission chose uh, to bring. And I think uh, we'll all be watching to see whether there's other uh, substitute securities cases in the future. In that last point you just made, where do you think do you think that that fits into the materiality analysis? Because I think you know you, you look at this case and one of the one of the potential you know areas of, of litigation risk for for the commission on these types of cases again here maybe maybe stronger in this instance because of that. But that is you know when you're when, you know you're right the initial reaction was oh my gosh this is going to be a huge you know huge problem for bringing case every you know, every time there's a merger you know. You're gonna to have to monitor the trading and all the all the all the targets. Competitors have to look at things industry wide, but here there are kind of some facts. And so, do you think that that fits in? If we're trying to kind of compartmentalize these facts into the elements that the SEC needs to prove, is is are you thinking of that in the context of materiality or what other where where else would that would that would that fit in? I mean, we're getting that question a lot from clients. I, I guess to the specific question, Kyle. Um, I've debated with a number of people whether it goes to materiality or whether it was a piece of the material not, of, of the information. The, the complaint isn't clear that this was one of the pieces of material non-public information, right, that was misappropriated, right, this additional information about, um, about the other company or whether that just went to Scienter. So I, I don't actually don't, don't know the answer to that. But to your other question, I guess, about or the other aspect of it, about how it relates to um, you know, how folks need to be thinking about that. I, I, you know, I think a few folks from the commission have been fair and clear on panels. And I think my impression is that, um, and I hope I'm right, that the commission wasn't making a statement that um, registrants, for example, need to be surveilling for every conceivable, you know, economically linked company when there's a merger. That, that doesn't seem like a viable policy. And I think it should be taken Personally, I think it should be taken as what it is. It's an insider trading case based on a particular theory, right, that the commission is pursuing. I think it would be untenable for, um, you know, re registrants that have, you know, 15G obligations and 204A obligations to start hypothesizing about what other securities in the marketplace might be affected by a particular merger. And I think that would, I don't, that, 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 that really can't be a, an actionable policy um, for, for firms to undertake. Um, but, but, you know, it certainly is the kind of question that people have been asking arising out of that, which is people always want to know. And it would be terrific if if we could hear, you know, at some point some guidance from the commission on that um, as to whether there's any expectations. But I, I take it for what it is. It's an insider trading case based on a particular set of facts. And there isn't really a new policy that flows from it. John, you mentioned that you may have been ahead of the game and have you know counseled some clients on these issues already in the past. Does now that we've seen this case and we see the the, the complaint filed by the SEC, how is that impacting the advice that you're giving your clients? So I, I mean, I, I think there are a couple things that that we've been, uh, you know, and I, I don't want to say anyone foresaw really the secondary, but but just the notion that misappropriation is a much broader theory than the classical theory from the standpoint of you can misappropriate information from any source and the source doesn't have to be connected to the issuer this the information just has to be about a security um so you know you see it in in lots of the you know kind of uh the cases around uh you know theft of ideas and things like that where where the information is you know disaggregated or the, the security is disaggregated from the source. Um, so I, I think that's really the, the bigger point from that. On the, on, I, I think the biggest takeaway for, in terms of, of talking to folks is 
making sure that they, um, in their training of employees, and when you're talking to asset managers, in their kind of thinking about issues like, you know, how do, how do we construct a, an information barrier around this, or how do we think about um, what we're trade, you know, what we're reviewing on a watch list, um, that they're sensitive to the, the idea that that information from or about one particular issuer could relate to securities of another issuer or other securities altogether. So if you think about um, kind of taking this concept even broader is, you know, you have a significant piece of information about company ABC that's part of, a, of an industry EFT. Um, you know, or ETF, then, then I think, you know, you have to think about whether you're restricted in the ETF in addition to, to just that one name. And, you know, and again, lots of firms have those policies, but I, I think um, just stepping back and considering the, the notion that, um, that information about a particular company uh, is, is just that, it's information, and it can be about not only that company, but but other securities as well, and, and making sure you're you're kind of considering that when you talk to your clients, and your clients are considering it when they're you know thinking about their their own uh, trading. Steve, one of the one of the you know unique facts about this was the insider trading trading policy that the company had, which essentially, as it is as the way I read it in the from the complaint, is that it explicitly you know barred trading and kind of any security. Have you gotten questions from your clients or are, are you advising clients to have that kind of policy or, or maybe even advise them not to have the kind of that policy because it might come with obligations that go with it that they might not want to have? How, you know, what's your thinking on what companies should do with their insider trading policies, given that this kind of, this, I don't want to call it unique because I'm not familiar with all kinds of companies' policies, but in this instance, it appears that the policy kind of applied beyond just the company's securities and it explicitly applied to kind of any security. Um, have you been, what, what are you, what questions are you getting or what kind of advice are you giving uh, on, uh, on the policy? We've got, we've gotten a lot of those questions and, and, and look, I mean, the commission doesn't have a policy nor is there a rule or regulation that obligates, for, particularly for public companies, right? There isn't a rule that obligates a particular framework for insider trading policies. And so the breadth or extent to which companies' um, policies, right, whether it's part of their business ethics code or whether it's a specific insider trading policy is really um, in, in many regards left to the discretion of the company. We have clients who have very broad policies similar to that one where they're really, you know, explicitly covering a lot of, of ground. And there's others that um, base it more on the definition of insider trading and barring it, leaving it to, you know, the employees and the definition of insider trading to cover it. So I, I don't think there's a one size fits all. I think companies have different, um, different goals in how they want to um, discourage. I think they all want to discourage insider trading, right? But how much they want to put on the employees, how much they want to put on restricted policy lists, how much they want to have options for um, choosing uh, when to approve or not approve trading, um, and then obviously the extent of their windows are all factors that companies that I think consider together um, in in how to how to address these policies. I think you know for, for some of us we'd probably talk about this case for <laughs> for the whole time, but maybe we'll, we'll move on to uh, our next topic just, uh, we just so we don't get too uh, too in the weeds. Um, so it's a fascinating case, and I think we'll you know we'll all be talking about it for a while. Um, you know, the next thing we want to talk about were the issues raised by the SEC settlement with Andover LLC last year. While Andover technically is not an insider trading case, uh, and it was brought under kind of the previous leadership, it raises interesting issues related to MNPI and anti-insider trading generally. Um, for those of you not familiar, I'll go through the facts uh, briefly if I can. Uh, Endeavor was, was an oil refining company, and it had been in confidential merger negotiations with Marathon Petroleum for a number of months uh, when the uh, negotiations were halted in the fourth quarter of 2017. Um, in the beginning of uh, 2018 in January, the CEO of Marathon told the CEO of Endeavor that it was ready to kind of restart and move forward with the negotiations again. Uh, you know, a few days before those negotiations resumed, uh, Endeavor's CEO directed the company to repurchase $250 million in company stock under a 10B5 plan that had been previously approved by the company's board. 
pursuant to that those to that directive and to the plan, it bought stock for you know I think one hundred and three dollars a share or lower for the for the buyback. Um, fast forward to April thirtieth. Endeavor announced a merger with Marathon at a price of $150 a share. So, you know, in hindsight, that, that decision to do the buyback at 103 was, was looking very, very wise. Um, the SEC uh, investigated and had concluded that Endeavor's internal controls were deficient because they had failed to ensure that the policies and procedures for the buyback plan would be satisfied. And in particular, they noted that the, that as part of the, their buyback process, they did not, if it, well, as part of the process in the buyback to determine whether or not the company had MNPI at the time of the purchase, they did not, that process did not include, you know, talking with the CEO or any discussions with the CEO to determine whether or not they had MNPI. And as a result of the settlement, the company agreed to pay a $20 million penalty and cease and desist from violations of the Exchange Act's internal controls provisions. Again, it wasn't brought as insider trading case, it was brought as a violation uh, or a failure to have sufficient internal control case. Um, Jennifer, uh, from, from, can you give us uh, the SEC perspective on this? And you know, should we be expecting more cases like this into the future? Well, of course, I cannot say whether we will be seeing more cases exactly like this. Um, no surprise there. Um, even, you know, will we be seeing more internal controls allegations on facts like this? I, that just depends, I, I think, in, in, um, in large part on the fact patterns that come before us and, and the commission. Um, but I do think what you will see, um, and, and certainly, again, I mean, this is right in the, in the wheelhouse of what the chair and director Grewal have been talking about um, in all of their speaking engagements this fall. MB51 plans are a focus, corporate insiders are a focus, gatekeepers are a focus. Um, in the, you know, in the last panel when Chair Gensler talked about the need for market participants and gatekeepers um, to keep back from the line and, and sort of the idea that if you're in a gray zone, um, maybe that's not where you want to be. I think this kind of conduct is an excellent space um, to heed that advice carefully. To our other panelists, you know, what kind of advice are you giving to your clients in, in, in light of this case? I mean, this, this, this case was last year, so we've had a little bit of time to reflect on, on, on what it means. Um, Steve, I'll start with you this time. What, what, you know, what, what kind of questions are you getting from your clients or, or what, what are the takeaways you see from this case? Uh, so a couple of thoughts. First of all, I think what, maybe this goes to your question on, on the Panua case also, Kyle, which is I think these kinds of cases cause our clients to ask and reevaluate their 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 policies and their procedures, right? They're trying to determine is the commission trying to send a message about what our policies need to be, right? And do we have adequate procedures in place when we um, undertake things like 10B51 plans? I, I, I do think, you know, Endeavor is obviously very different because it leans on the internal controls uh, over financial reporting, which is uh, I think that aspect of it is a is a very new and unusual way to look at you know, material non-public information. Um, and I think that's, of course, generated a lot of, a lot of discussions. I, I think the thing I, I want to highlight, I think that's relevant to how a lot of us think about advising our clients is, um, at least as I read it, it's not um, the internal controls over financial reporting don't explicitly or directly get at, at trading, right? The way Endeavor got, got at it specifically was the certain aspect of, of the, the rules over internal controls over financial reporting that require companies to have um, policies and procedures to ensure that transactions are executed in accordance with management's authorization, which is a very specific or, or one, one might say narrow aspect of it. So they, they didn't just say, oh, you have to have policies and procedures. They said, in that case, right, there was an aspect, right, that wasn't followed where there wasn't an appropriate internal control as a result of the fact that the board's approval Require, had, a, had a specific requirement that these transactions were executed consistent with the federal securities laws and while the company um, is not in possession of material non-public information. So I think sort of one interesting question as we go forward is, 
um, if the commission's confronted with other fact patterns that don't fit all of those right check 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 boxes, what will they do? Um, I don't I don't think we know. Um, I think many of us have seen other investigations um, of that nature, and I think to the staff's credit, I haven't seen other ones, and I don't know where others are, but we have seen circumstances where insider trading cases have shifted to questions about internal controls, and the staff has been persuadable that um, you know maybe it didn't fit that precise standard, um, and I think time will tell where others of those where others of those cases land. Um, I think the other aspect of it as it relates to, to, I think, client questions is it it raises a fair question of, on one hand, how broad or how narrow you want your policies here to be. In other words, there, there's, it's interesting because the more explicit and clear your policies and procedures are, um, it certainly provides for clients, um, assuming you follow your policies and procedures, at least theoretically a safety net, right? You say, here's our policy, here's our procedure. If it's sufficient, we followed it. Um, that ought to be good. On the flip side, I think one has to wonder right, where the Endeavor case would have landed if there was uh, a narrow, narrower authorization by the board, right, that didn't offer an explicit link to the internal controls provisions. I don't know the answer to that question, but it's sort of a, it's the double-edged sword of this, right? The broader you make the policy, the more you put into the board's authorization and give the opportunity to link it to that aspect of the internal controls, um, right, the more opportunity there is to, to have a potential violation. And I think um, I, I'm not putting a value judgment on one or the other. I think they're the right questions to ask, and I think companies are are grappling with where to land on that. In my experience, John, what's your perspective on that? Sure. So, I mean, I I I think it's hard to look at Endeavor without also thinking about Aries, and I know we talked about Aries last year. Um, but but it's another policies and procedures controls case that that came out of facts that you might otherwise think would or could. Uh, lead to an insider trading charge, but uh, but but didn't. Um, and and I think you know from from the standpoint, you know, I, I think if you were to step back and again, not knowing the the staff's view or or the the respondent's view in either case, um, but if you step back, like both of these situations, Aries unspecified, but just from the types of information they were talking about, um, you know, involved kind of pretty thorny and highly judgmental. Uh, evaluations and decisions with respect to the materiality of information and endeavor the materiality of, of early stage potential merger negotiations, which, you know, is a, has been a problem in the federal securities laws for, you know, 50 years. Um, so I, I think the, you know, the notion of um, that, that we always preach to our clients of, you know, in, in circumstances where you're talking about highly judgmental, difficult decisions, it's better to be careful than right always because you can demonstrate kind of care to the commission. I, I think the message that we've taken to our clients from these cases is, you know, in some respects, it doesn't matter if you're right if you aren't careful. Um, so I, I, I think that that you have to kind of step back and say, you know, the, the fact that um, I, I'm assuming, and again, not knowing anything, but assuming that these cases were at some point at least investigated as potential insider trading uh, or 10B cases um, and didn't end up there, um, you know, the, the view was that, that it wasn't appropriate to charge that. Um, but, but what was appropriate was, you know, that that wasn't a record that was made easy by the respective companies' decisions uh, and documentation, which is, you know, something that's, that's, kind of important in both cases. So I, I think that's really the message we take from it is, you know, if you're going to have a policy and procedures that involve making those kinds of tough, close calls, um, then you, you need to have a policy and procedures that, that require you to document them uh, pretty thoroughly and, and that those need to be part of your uh, kind of DNA in terms of how you think about those, those discussions. For other clients, you know, they take the view and I think probably not wrongly that maybe you should have a policy that doesn't permit those kinds of close calls <laughs> because there, there may, it may just be the fact that no matter how it comes out, you, you could find yourself in trouble um, uh, just by having gotten, uh, you know, encountered the scrutiny. Thank you. Okay, we'll be, um, move on to kind of our, our, our next topic. And the next thing we want, the next topic we wanted to talk about was, kind of, you know, the issues raised by, uh, by expert networks. Um, you know, I don't think we've seen an expert network case in a while, but, but as we were preparing for this, you know, we noticed that there are kind of 
similar issues that have been re- that are raised by kind of either political salt- consultants, and we kind of see similar issues raised by kind of alternative data providers. Um, and so, I guess, John, I'll maybe sticking with you, you know, are expert networks and kind of these related issues still something you're getting questions from clients about? Is this, is this an issue we still should be focused on? Yeah, I, I think it is. I mean, I, I think they they kind of, in my mind at least, they've they've started to coalesce into generally the notion of third party data sources, <laughs> and and so whether it's a human data source or some you know giant file or or other piece of information, it it they all seem to be coming kind of in in many and and come with many of the same risks and and require some of the same policies. So I I do think that that we continue to get questions on those, you know, the, the nature and types of experts, um, you know, some with their own data, some without their own data, just their experience, uh, I, I think are, are, you know, those are proliferating, at least in terms of what's being marketed to kind of institutional uh, clients of ours. And so I, I, I do think that we get a lot of questions still about, you know, how do we engage with these data sources? How do we make sure we're engaging in a way that, um, that's not only kind of uh, away from the line, but but is demonstrably away from the line. So in a way that that we can, uh, whether it's to exams or whether to the enforcement staff, if we're ever questioned, that we can show them that you know we we did take pains to make sure that we were not engaging either a, a you know a data provider or an expert who was going to be giving us uh, information that was tainted uh, as as material non public information and and the biggest issue that that we face in all of those is what level of diligence is really required um, you know if it's an expert into kind of their own reps if you're not going through one of the big expert service providers um, who you know do a good job of of i think vetting their experts generally um, if it's data, you know, what rep, what diligence can you do? What are you able to do? And what comfort can you get by, by their sources of data? You know, I, I, and I know we'll talk about App Annie at some point, but, you know, are, are you, are, do you really have visibility into where they're getting their data and whether that data is, um, you know, is something that you need to worry about was obtained, you know, in violation of a duty and in such a way that could subject you to liability down the road? And that's a good segue. I think you know what, one of the recent cases that kind of touches on these issues is is the App Annie case. And so, you know, Jennifer, I was hoping you could you could kind of walk through us, walk that walk through the facts of that case for us very briefly as we're getting kind of close on time sure. and kind of kind of sure. tell us what you can again, kind of from you know what was the SEC's perspective or what's the conduct that was driving that case? Okay, sure. So App Annie's on the other side of the transaction. App Annie is the data provider. Um, that was not an insider trading case. It was a good old fashioned misrep 10 D case, um, at least in terms of the, of the legal theory. So app Annie is a data provider. It's got two different services. One is the connect service, uh, which is a free service. It offers app makers or, or companies that make apps. Um, it, it gets credentials to the app stores and aggregates that data and collects it to be used by its customers. On the other side, they have an intelligence service. Um, That's a paid service marketed mostly to trading firms. um, And they marketed as data that was anonymized and aggregated relating to apps um, that could be used to make trading decisions. Um, But those representations were were misreps. Um, in fact, App Annie used the confidential information um, to m- alter the estimates, um, you know, go beyond what its algorithms were doing to make it more marketable and more usable um, for trading purposes. So a couple just quick important things. I know we're short on time. No trading firms were charged, just App Annie and its CEO. Um, Maybe, uh, you know, I will, I'll leave it to John and Steve, um, but it, it, it may be a serve as a good reminder um, for trading firms to do some oversight of their vendors. Right. And Steve, I, I, I think, I mean, I would ask Deanna for this question, but I, but I think I, I can guess that she wouldn't be able to answer it. Um, I will ask you instead, and that is, this was an insider trading case against a trading firm. Are we going to see an insider trading case against a, fir- a, a firm in a situation like this for the use, its use of alternative data? 
I mean, I wish I had a crystal ball, but I, I, what I would say is it feels to me like that would be a, a complicated, candidly, a complicated legal theory, right? I, I, it feels to me more like, and, and looking at the work that the exam program has been doing in this area um, with various clients, that um, it's more likely if we, see, if we see any enforcement cases arising out of this work by, by exams and others, it feels a little bit more like 204A or some other path like that regarding, as others have been saying, the oversight of these firms would be the first step. Obviously, if the fact pattern presents itself, I'm sure the commission would be delighted to bring such a case. Um, but I mean, in my experience, firms, you know, they, they have agreements with reps and warranties. They do a fair amount of due diligence regarding these vendors. Um, I don't want to put any, um, uh, as, as Jennifer noted, there was no trading firms charge. And at least I read the opinion. I don't know that it was, there's anything intentional about it, but um, it is pretty clear from the opinion that in, in, in the App Annie case, the trading firms were viewed in some regards as even victims in the sense that they were misled, right? Part of the mis- the, 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 the So um, I think for trading firms, I, I think policies and procedures so far appear to be the order of the day. I have no idea what's in the commission's pipeline, but I, I think that's the way people are thinking about it. Um, and it is a pretty indirect theory even at that given that the trading firms don't have control over the data but but can only have control over the due diligence they do for the sources of that data all right and we are almost out of time so i think i'm going to kick off kind of our last question in maybe 30 seconds or left for each one of you kind of what you know where do you see the sec going or where do you see the sec pushing the boundaries in insider trading cases kind of in the coming year uh and, and john i'll start with you um, I, I actually, you know, not to disagree with Steve, I, I actually do think that there's, they're going to be looking for some sort of third party data source case, because I, I think that's, such, it's proliferating so much across the, the, the institutional trading environment. Um, I, I agree that it would have to be a pretty clear case and pretty egregious facts, but, but I, I would think that that's something that um, you know that that the staff would uh, would want to push, and and it may be you know something that that kind of the the data analytics can help them with um, because it would it would make some of the link uh, important. Uh, but I, I, you know, it's hard to know, obviously. But uh, but I think otherwise we're we're going to see you know a continued drumbeat of of the standard insider trading cases, and and then continued uh, expansion of of the use of of data and and how those how the how it can inform kind of bigger, uh, more, more deep seated cases. All right, Steve, how about, how about 30 seconds? Then 30 we'll seconds or last. Word. Yeah. To, to be clear, John, I a hundred percent agree. They're looking for those cases. I, I, I just was saying <laughs> that I think they're legally complicated. I have no doubt they want to bring them and, and that they're looking hard. I, I, I guess I, I rather than be duplicative of, of John's list, cause I think that's right. I, I think we're also going to see, uh, continued efforts around policies and procedures, and internal controls. I think, in addition to the various types of insider trading cases, I think um, that, uh, for better or for worse, we're going to see, you know, where there are insider trading cases, a look to, you know, companies and uh, trading firms' policies and procedures in that area. All right, Jennifer, last word. Well, I don't, I don't have any big surprises other than to reiterate. <laughs> To reiterate what I said at the opening, which is that um, it, it's certainly true that our steady drumbeat of, of uh, historical insider trading cases will continue, uh, but we really are going to be focused on corporate insiders, gatekeepers, 10B51 plans. All right. Well, thank you guys so much. I, I feel like we could talk about some of this stuff for hours without a problem, but I will hand it back to Bruce because we, we are out of time for today. Thanks, Kyle. Uh, well, well done. Um, and thanks for some interesting predictions there. We'll, we will check back next year and we will, we will see uh, what, what really happens. But uh, terrific panel. Our next panel is at 225 and it will be covering uh, FCPA. So we'll see you in five minutes. Thank you.